In solemn agreement with 25 other nations, the United States has set as its immediate goal a complete victory over the Axis aggressors. Since the treacherous attack on Pearl Harbor, the American people have closed their ranks. They are now determined to mobilize to the utmost their vast physical, human, and moral resources for the total destruction of German and Japanese militarism. As President Roosevelt has declared, we are resolved to fight on any and all fronts, wherever we can make our power count for most, in order that the menace of fascist aggression may be crushed once and for all. Yet, however we view it, the task ahead of us is a gigantic one. At the outset, it is well for us not to underestimate the strength of our enemies. This is a war not of our choosing, but of theirs. As the aggressors, they hold the initial advantage of having prepared for war years in advance. Their war machines are already running at maximum capacity, while ours is still only partly mobilized. This situation holds even for our two major allies, the British Commonwealth and the Soviet Union, although they are much closer to all-out production and equipment than we are. By and large, it is also true that the Axis powers have had greater experience in operating the latest instruments of land warfare than have the United Nations. Despite the huge losses suffered by the Nazis in the Russian campaign this winter, they still possess formidable reserves of seasoned manpower, airplanes, tanks, and submarines. According to conservative estimates, the striking power of Hitler's Germany appears still to be sufficiently great for the launching of new offensives this spring on a large scale, perhaps in the Mediterranean or the Middle East, perhaps against Russia, possibly even against the British Isles. While it is more difficult to gauge Japan's capacity for consolidating her recent victories in the Pacific, there is little doubt that if Singapore and the Dutch East Indies should fall within her grasp, the job, of, the job of dislodging her would be as costly as it would be time-consuming. Nor should we make the mistake of anticipating an, an early internal crack-up in either Germany or Japan. Now that the entire free world is aligned against these two, these two totalitarian regimes, they realize that there can be no compromise. Their fanatical rulers know that defeat, if it comes, will mean not only the end of all their hopes for aggrandizement, but their personal destruction as well. Faced with such a prospect, they and their peoples are likely to fight on doggedly until they are overwhelmingly crushed by superior force. Fear of defeat will but intensify the ruthlessness and trickery for which the Nazi and Japanese warlords have now become notorious for all time. Yet there is another and brighter side to this picture. Obvious weaknesses in the position of our enemies, as compared with our own potential strength, give ground for believing that we can beat the aggressors if we but persevere. In order to win, the Axis powers must break out of the continents within which they are now contained. So long as the Russian war machine remains intact, Germany and Japan cannot gain access to the raw materials necessary for a successful sea and air offensive against the steadily expanding sea and air power of the United Nations. Europe and Asia alone, minus Russia, do not produce sufficient quantities of petroleum, lubricating oils, copper, lead, zinc, asbestos, and other strategic minerals for an indefinite continuation of machine warfare on any such scale. Notwithstanding the huge stockpiles of materials which have been built up in both Germany and Japan, there are definite signs that, that the supply is beginning to run low. Reliable port reports indicate that the German war effort is already suffering from shortages of fuel oil, fats, fodder for cattle, and the alloys essential to the production of steel. Not only has Germany itself been combed for every available bit of scrap metal, but the occupied countries are now rapidly being stripped as well. Only the other day, for example, came the news that the Nazis were melting down the street statues in the city of Paris. While Germany is not likely to be starved into submission, it is encouraging for us to hear that the German meat ration is 20% less this winter than it was a year ago, that wool and cotton textiles are no longer abundant in Nazi land seems clear from the recent reduction of the civilian clothing allowance by 40%. 
We know also of the desperate appeals now being made to all Germans to surrender their warm winter clothing to the half-frozen soldiers on the Russian front. The production of war munitions in Nazi-controlled Europe is further handicapped by a serious shortage of skilled labor. With the increasing evidences of sabotage and slowdown tactics on the part of Czech, French, Belgian, Dutch, and Norwegian workers, the labor situation will probably go worse each passing month. When to this difficulty one adds the rapid deterioration of railway rolling stock, it is not surprising that the Nazis are no longer finding it possible to operate the industrial equipment of the European continent at anything like full capacity. During the last few months, the haunting specter of disease has raised itself in Eastern Europe. Typhus is reported to be spreading rapidly among the retreating German forces along the Russian front and behind the lines in Poland. Because of a lack of serums and other medical supplies, it may prove very difficult to prevent this deadly epidemic from sweeping westward into the territories of the Reich itself. In still other ways, Germany is at last beginning to feel the ugly side of the war. After being fed for almost two years upon reports of a seemingly endless succession of victories, the German home front now has to be satisfied with the pathetically involved attempts of Dr. Goebbels' propaganda machine to explain away the retreat from Moscow and the loss of the Caucasus. Legless and armless victims of the battlefield now appear in ever-increasing numbers on the streets of Berlin and Munich. No longer is it possible entirely to conceal the lengthening casualty, li casualty lists, which now exceed two million men for the Russian campaign alone. So long as foodstuffs and fine wearing apparel from the conquered countries continued to pour into Germany, it seemed like a prosperous war to the folks back home. But little more plunder remains to be seized from looted France, Belgium, and Holland. The pinch is coming home to the members of the master race who were promised in 1940 that Britain would fall before the year was out, and were assured by their Führer last fall that Moscow would be occupied before Christmas. The legend, legend of Hitler's infallibility, so assiduously and adroitly cultivated by the Nazi propagandists, would appear to be shattered by the amazing triumphs of the Soviet armies. Now that Hitler himself has assumed personal charge of military operations, he may find it less easy to pin the blame for defeat upon his generals, the best of whom have recently been relieved of their commands or otherwise taken care of by the Gestapo. <clears throat> if Japan, in contrast to Germany, seems at the moment to be a fresher antagonist, we may take some comfort from the fact that her lines of communications are being extended more and more thinly as she attempts to surround all of the southwestern Pacific region in a giant pincers movement. Some of the ships of the Mikado are now operating more than 3,000 miles from home. Japanese re reserve supplies, moreover, are nowhere nearly so adequate as those of Nazi-dominated Europe, while the industrial capacity of Japan is but a fraction of that of Germany. All of this leads to but one conclusion, and that is that the only substantial advantage now held by the Axis, in comparison with the United Nations, is their head start in converting natural resources into the, into the instrumentalities of machine warfare. The United States alone produces almost one half of the world's supply of industrial raw materials. Together with our allies, we control 63% of the production of iron, 67% of the production of coal, and 78% of the production of petroleum, the three most important sinews of modern war. Our steel production capacity exceeds that of the entire Axis control area by over 50%. In Canada, we have access to 90% of the world's supply of nickel, while the American output of copper is six times that of Europe. As regards foodstuffs, the United States, together with the Soviet Union, the British Dominions, and friendly Latin America, possess a granary ample for the maintenance of the peoples and armed forces of the United Nations throughout as long a struggle as can now be foreseen, provided, of course, the sea lanes are kept open. Concerning the key problem of shipping, the outlook outlook for the democracies has changed remarkably in their favor during the past six months.
Today, the production rate of merchant ships in England and America actually exceeds the rate of losses from Axis attack. Last year, our shipyards alone turned out over a million deadweight tons of shipping. While for the present year, the President's program calls for 8 million tons, with 10 million in 1943. If carried out according to schedule, this will be the greatest shipbuilding effort in history. Although we are still far from having completed the construction of our two ocean navy, our naval program, along with Britain's, is progressing so rapidly that unchallenged Anglo-American control of all the oceans may be anticipated within less than two years. It is not generally known that despite months of aerial bombardment, British shipyards were able during 1941 to deliver nearly 500 warships to the British Navy. Turning to the air, we have every reasonable assurance that the combined production of planes by Britain and America will soon pass any number that Germany, Italy, and Japan can possibly manufacture under existing conditions. As our rate goes up, that of the Axis will gradually but surely decline. Quoting from a report issued not long ago by the Office of Facts and Figures in Washington, in 1942 alone we will produce nearly three times as many weapons and supplies of war as in all the 18 months since the fall of France. In 1942 alone, we will produce as many tanks and planes as Hitler did in all the years before 1939, when he was preparing for world conquest. In available manpower, the aggregate superiority of the United Nations over the Axis camp is overwhelming. Even if, if we exclude the huge population reservoir of China and India, our side has at its disposal a potential armed force of 20 million to 30 million men without seriously crippling our industrial labor supply. By whatever measure one takes, the technological and inventive genius of the United States can match anything the Nazis and the Japanese have yet shown, let alone what they can do from now on. More important than this physical superiority in the long run are the moral and psychological weapons at our command. Democracy may be slower than totalitarianism in organizing for war, but once it has set its objective, democracy possesses the invaluable advantage of self-discipline. <clears throat> the superb courage displayed by the British and Chinese peoples in resisting the invader against crushing odds is sufficient testimony to this fact. We Americans are a people traditionally accustomed to performing great national tasks without requiring the whiplash of authority to spur us on. To be sure, the total warfare of our day depends for success upon a high degree of technical organization. But American industry and American transportation have long led the world in their faculty for efficient, large-scale enterprise. There is no reason why we cannot, cannot fuse our governmental, industrial, and administrative capacity for a united war effort that will beat Hitler and the Japanese at their own game. All of this can happen if we, will, if we will it to happen. What we have most to fear is not the armed legions of the Axis, but too great a sense of complacency here at home. Our people must be told the hard truth when military reverses occur, as they will certainly continue to occur for many months to come. The cause of final victory is not served by sugarcoating reports of losses at sea, on land, or in the air. In the stirring language of President Roosevelt, we must prove to ourselves that we can take it and take it again without yielding to a mood of defeatism, however temporary. By every diabolical means within his power, the enemy will try to sow dissension in our ranks. This has been the favorite method by which Hitler has prepared every one of his conquests. Long before they reach the end of their rope, Berlin and Tokyo, each in its own way, are likely to resort to devious maneuvers designed to wean us away from Britain or from Russia or China from the other democracies, as circumstances seem to favor. There will doubtless be insidious offers of a se separate peace to one or more of the major powers now fighting the Axis. When such offers come, it will be up to us to employ all our diplomatic and propaganda skill in exposing them for what they really are. Above all, we shall need to have faith in our chosen leaders, in their grand strategy for winning the war, in the valor of our fighting men. Simply put, 
We are fighting so that we and our allies may survive as free and independent communities. But our goal is something even more, and that is the opportunity to build a better world for our children to live in. At this 11th hour, we should realize that our priceless heritage of freedom can no longer be taken for granted. It is being challenged to the death. In meeting that challenge, however, we owe it to ourselves and the world to take thought of tomorrow. If a durable peace is to follow the tragic struggle now thrust upon us, the United States must measure up to the heavy responsibility which history has thrust upon this nation. In fulfilling this responsibility, we shall have to be prepared to undertake international commitments little dreamed of a few years ago. The pre-1939 world is dead and gone, and the anguished peoples of this globe, once they are liberated from the yoke of fascism, are going to insist upon some kind of new order. The aggressors can't possibly win if we resolutely and unitedly strive for a peace which will pave the way for a more humane, a more cooperative, and a more prosperous world community than mankind has yet imagined. This is the supreme condition of our victory.